This episode of Artist Decoded is brought to you by No Wave Academy. As creatives and artists, we have each personally experienced the turbulent road of artistic self-improvement. And as the co-founder of the LA-based artist collective, No Wave and No Wave Academy, I can tell you that our objective is to offer an alternative path to a traditional arts education. No Wave Academy courses are taught by some of our favorite artists. They're also our personal heroes and colleagues. Some of these artists you may have heard on this very podcast, while others have been featured in exhibitions at the No Wave Gallery. Such artists include Casey Baugh, Mia Bergeron, Nick Rungi, Sean Cheatham, and Kate Zambrano, to name a few. All of our instructors are working professional artists that have been showcased in galleries and museums, both locally and around the world. At No Wave Academy, we work tirelessly towards evolving the way you learn and to expand your artistic passion and craft from the very best in the field. We believe that everyone has a unique artistic spirit. With guidance, experience, and the proper tools, students have the ability to invigorate and elevate their work. You can unlock and unblock your creative inner voice. Join us and walk into the next chapter of your personal artistic evolution. Go to nowaveacademy.com, that's N-O-H waveacademy.com, type in AD-10 at checkout for 10% off. Now, on to the episode. Hey all you beautiful, wonderful, amazing, kind people. It's almost the end of the year and you're tuning in to another episode of Artist Decoded and I'm your lovely host, Yoshino. So welcome to the podcast. If you've never heard of us before, we are a podcast that examines art from many different angles, from neuroscience to anything from a more traditional art form, such as painting or filmmaking or fighting. And this particular episode, I'm able to talk to Laura Freed, who is a co-founder and director of Active Cultures, which is a nonprofit organization based in Los Angeles that explores the convergence of food and art in contemporary life. And she's also worked exclusively as a curator for museums such as Mass Mocha and the Contemporary Art Museum of St. Louis, and has also served as the founding artistic director of the Seattle Art Fair. And in this episode, we talk about her collaborative partnership with fellow co-founder of Active Cultures, contemporary artist Glenn Kino, who has also been on this podcast on an earlier episode. We also talk about her intentions with this project, along with her thoughts on her accumulated experiences as a curator, which inevitably led her to creating her nonprofit. And my business partner, Justin Dosher Hopkins, and I, hey buddy, how are you? We're lucky enough to be able to try one of their limited edition home assembly kits, which is a collaboration between world-renowned chef Nikki Nakayama, Carol Lita Nakayama, and artist Glenn Kino. And they were kind enough to send us a very lovely package, which is still available in Los Angeles until mid-January. So if you're into maybe a romantic dinner with a nicely lit candle from the artist Glenn Kino sitting there on a table with a nicely curated playlist, you should definitely... Well, you know, don't don't let me tell you what to do, but Justin and I had a really beautiful experience, you know, just staring into each other's eyes as most business partners do. And um, you can have that experience as well if you go to homeassembly.active-cultures.org. They still have some kits available, so you should go check it out. It includes a seared albacore sashimi salad, and a delectable bronzino udon dish, uh, which I was quite the fan of. It has these little clams in it and mussels, and um, it's a beautiful little dish for all you people that are curious out there. 
And uh, then it was finished off with a yuzu pound cake uh, with whipped cream and uh, fresh fruit for dessert. Uh, it made me feel fancy. Um, I don't know if you all like to feel fancy, but I like to feel fancy every once in a while. And as my uncle would say sometimes at holiday dinners, um, completely unannounced, it made my taste buds do the tango. I always remember that because I just thought it was such a cute little saying and I'm still in it, uncle. So there you go. All right. Enough of the dad jokes. This is my conversation with Laura Freed, the co-founder and director of Active Cultures. Hope you enjoy it. Thanks so much for doing this and being on the podcast. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. Of course. Yeah. I wanted to ask, like, how did you meet Glenn Kino and what sort of conversations did you have before wanting to start Active Cultures? Oh, um, I'm so glad you asked that. Glenn and I have known each other a long time. Now we're art world buddies. Um, he's known my partner, Matthew, a long time. But I worked with Glenn in our first formal capacity as curator artist, respectively, when I was still working with the Seattle Art Fair. I was the founding artistic director of the fair. It was a fair that Paul Allen had founded as a way to bring in part public art to Seattle. And my charge was to develop projects, public projects in the city and at the fair and a series of talks to, uh, to the event. And I was there for its first two years of having an artistic director. Glenn was the first artist I reached out to to commission a project for the fair, in part because I knew Glenn right away would understand this nexus and this the interest in this nexus between science and technology, public art, futurism, you know, contemporary art. Mm. And he'd been working on a project. He'd been developing a few projects for exhibitions that I was aware of. And immediately when we started talking about a project, Glenn proposed that he develop an idea he'd been working on for an exhibition whereby he had been researching with some PhD phoneticians and mm. um, experts in language, how to imagine what our language would look like once we had colonized places in space, say Mars or the moon. He actually fashioned a dialect, a kind of patois, based on what we know of how language is developed in through colonization, the English language in particular, a patois for what the English language and I think he just he'd also developed a lunar language for French based on our factors like lack of oxygen and what sounds look like when transmitted through radio waves. So he developed a script, a tour of the fair and nearby neighborhood of Seattle in this Martian English. And we invited Speed Levitch. I don't know if you know of Speed. Speed is a, a kind of performance artist all his own, although he's never really been formally recognized in, as such. Um, he's a famous tour guide in New York. He was made famous by a film that was produced in the 90s called The Cruise, black and white film. The name mm -hmm. of the director escapes me, Where, um, which is all about Speed's poetry, his passion for arcane facts about New York City and these tours that he led. I mean, it's a, remember, it's a movie I remember from college, in fact. So we reached out to Speed and invited Speed to come out and give tours in Glenn's Martian English hmm. through the mm -hmm. art fair into the empty football stadium there and around the city. It was a really fantastic project. That was, I think, back in 2016. And it wasn't long after that that Glenn and I just started talking about other projects. At the same time, this is a long story, forgive me. The same time Glenn no, 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 continue. connected for the first time with Nikki Nakayama, Chef Nikki, through a wonderful woman, Mary Wagstaff, who came to be a founding board member with Glenn on, at Active Cultures. Glenn connected with Nikki and had been talking about, with Nikki, opportunities to do something collaboratively. This is the core of Glenn's practice, um, as it is as an artist, is ways that he can bring experts in other fields together to make change through art and activism. And 
they had been talking about um, a series of performative dinners. They were thinking big and small. Glenn called me because he knew of my passion for food and mm -hmm. asked if I would lend some curatorial muscle to the project. We sat down with Nikki and quickly <laughs> came to the idea of this roaming dinner series called the MSG Club mm -hmm. that was designed to upend the kinds of prejudices we bring to the table when we eat, whether it's stigmas about ingredients or prejudices about culture. And the central conceit of the dinner is that each dinner cooked by a different chef in different cities would take the food fears of the mm -hmm. dinner guests and turn them into a meal that everyone would enjoy. Um, and mm. we produced dinners in New York and LA and Mexico City, which was really a touchstone for our project. And it, one, we produced one dinner at Ennaka, which is the one meal Nikki and uh, Carol cooked. But it was that project and it was that conversation with Nikki and her wife, Carol, when we really began to think about the intersection between art and food and how vital it was we started to see the pattern between, which I, I've thought about in my own curatorial practice for a long time, the, mm -hmm. this history of artists being deeply invested in food as mm -hmm. material, as a means for expression, as a way to convene and gather and think about social practice of art. Mm -hmm. And you know, as you can imagine, chefs for a long time have been interested in art and the art world. And there have only been really surface connections made or projects here and there that have shown up at museums or, you know, in galleries um, mm -hmm. with a few famous examples like Rick Ritt, Tervini, uh making Thai food in mm -hmm. the early 90s in his commercial gallery in New York in the white world space, right? Mm -hmm. And Glenn and I started scheming on what it would look like to create an institution that would bring the two together in a formal way and not to make equivalencies between food and art, not to say food is art and all art is about food, you know, certainly not, but instead to say, these are two vital facets of cultural production. There need to be more spaces where we can offer folks in food, whether they're chefs or writers or farmers or activists, a space for critical engagement um, and to give them the kind of support and framework that artists have in institutions that they haven't had before. And on the other hand, to make a space for the kind of social practice using food that artists don't always enjoy from institutions, you know, that, that mm. where those opportunities are few and far between and to see what yeah. happens when we bring that discourse, those, dis those tandem discourses together. So we, started hosting these MSG club dinners also as a way to bring all these folks together to begin going deeper into the conversations about the possibilities. And this was in 2017 and 18. And at the same time, we started building the board and visioning the organization. And we founded formally in 2018 and, and got our nonprofit status last year in 2019. And that's when we started producing our public programs. This was meant to be, 2020 was our first full year of public programming with wow. a project that, with <laughs> a one with our first signature commissions project that was scheduled for March 14th of this year, which wow. was, you know, two days before we canceled everything. <laughs> everything, yeah. It was, um, it was a project which we'll produce again. We are committed to doing it. It may not happen for another year or two because of the, the context for the project. But we had organized a 50 artist performance marathon and had enlisted six chefs from different, from Los Angeles to cook uh, soup and tarts. And it was a project, uh, it was a reprisal project uh, meant to pay homage to the original happening from the early seventies at the kitchen in New York by the French mm -hmm. artist Jean Dupuy. Uh, and we yeah. had 400 people registered to come in a warehouse downtown. And then we had to cancel <laughs> and mm -hmm. pivot. So then how, you know, given the, you know, it seems like everything has been leading up to, you know, this year and you were saying that you had lots of plans for 2020, but how have you been able to pivot given the state of the world and the pandemic? And, you know, it seems like a lot of the events that you had going on were centered around gatherings of people yeah you know so what is the 
mindset now, you know, going into the future of um, what active cultures is going to uh, represent and how it's going to be presented to the outside public? Yeah, that's the question, right? And something that we dug into as soon as we sent the letter to um, all of our soup and tart guests and the artists and the chefs that were prepared to make that possible, right? This moment, you know, particularly the first wave of the pandemic and since the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and the Black Lives Matter uprising and the protests that happened in Los Angeles, it all created a vital context for us to look at our mission, you know, our mission, which was still evolving because of the programs we were planning and what we saw ahead and what we see for this organization and dig into it even more deeply. I have to say it's no secret that the two communities that were hit hardest and most immediately by the pandemic were the food world, not only the restaurant industry, right, but farm workers and service industry workers and everyone along the supply chain that already and pre-pandemic faces deep and toxic systemic inequities, you know, all the way to who gets access to what kind of food. There's that. And artists and how artists, particularly those who have markets that are less stable because, you know, they're performance artists, dancers, folks who who may not have the kind of stable and strong market at the very top to sustain them yeah. as galleries, you know, are figuring out what they're doing and institutions were canceling everything were compromised seriously. Mm. And, you know, uh, so it meant that we took a moment to think about what was at stake, where our place could be in the landscape and how every conversation that we develop from that moment on from you know, the beginning of April forward, even as we brought programs online, would be to make a space, to hold a space, to discuss these issues and think about the future. We started developing a series of programs, um, one called Food Material, one called At the Table, meant to bring folks, to convene folks, to have critical conversations around food ways and art practice. Um, these are projects originally that were meant to be in person and in Los Angeles, um, free to the public, and um, and they will be. You know, we we produced a really beautiful series of both, and we'll continue them on into early next year with the plan to start producing those in person in public space in Los Angeles as soon as we can do so safely. As an institution, because we don't have a space, we don't have the burden of rent and utilities, uh, or a team that needs to be on site to work. Um, we have the capacity to be really nimble in how we approach our activities. And conceived as we are as a public arts organization, it means we can really adapt to guidelines and limitations for how we can gather and when. But we've also been approaching it very conservatively. Um, so. We're planning to start hosting programs in person later next year with the caveat that things are uncertain still. Mm. But if, if LA gets to a place where gatherings can happen in person safely and distance and even with food potentially outdoors, you know, in public mm. parks in Los Angeles, we'll do that as soon as we can. I mean, we're hoping yeah. that our first program can be of next year can be a Juneteenth celebration, which would be an important marker for us and for those folks that we've been working with to yeah. come back and celebrate being together. But we're planning some really exciting programs with other institutions, other organizations in Los Angeles with some really wonderful artists and folks in food to, to convene in all ways that we can and to bring tangible experience back to folks too. Definitely. Um, and then we have our we have a publishing program and an online digest that we'll be building into next year. And that's a way to keep the discourse alive and growing to our audience outside of LA. With these gatherings, what sort of conversations do you find to be the most interesting and also things that you feel are the most important, you know, given that the restaurant industry has been, you know, widely affected because of the pandemic, but also, you know, these social movements that have been occurring simultaneously with like the pandemic and, you know, the, 
and also like within politics, but like what sort of conversations do you find to be the most interesting that you want to bring forward, bringing artists and chefs and people that work in the food industry together? Yeah, that's um, that's a great question. I can say, although it, we won't announce the programs until January, we're already in conversation with a couple of artists about separate projects who are both focused on the legacies of the forced migration from the South to the West, the Westward migration. And one series that we're developing now will be uh, focused on a series of convenings among Black women, creatives in design and food, film and art, to discuss the, the legacy of forced migration westward, the impact on their own creative practices, and how memory and cooking have an impact on healing. And our plan is to develop these series of live convenings online um, with a group of folks, but also, you know, we really want to build, um, this will be an opportunity to build community through these conversations too online, and then resulting in um, a public program or even two with a meal in person as, you know, as soon as we're able to do so. And another series that we are sort of tangent to that is a series that we've developed called At the Table, which is focused on bringing folks in food together to discuss issues that are most critical to foodways at the moment, um, which uh, will touch on not only what the industry is facing, the kind of most visible issues like the impact on restaurants and their staff and their families by the shutdown and the mercurial and mm-hmm. whipsaw advice they're getting from the city. Mm-hmm. You know, there's actually, there's an article by Lucas Quan Peterson today in the LA Times calling for the support that restaurants need in a, at a dire time. But yeah. beyond that, there are issues that are more hidden, like who has access to land in agriculture. You know, these are vital issues to folks in the West, especially, and in California, who, which is um, a major producer of um, much of the country's agriculture. But there are serious systemic inequities when it comes to land rights, you know, especially when you're talking about tribal nations and immigrant farmers. A, a central question for us is whose voices are really amplified, even in this moment, as certain conversations become more fashionable, let's say, in mainstream media, there's still a dearth of visibility for a lot of folks who are struggling with, you know, beautiful practices. And I'm I'm really talking about food here um, that don't have the kind of mainstream attention that they need. And that, you know, especially if their practice is rooted in making visible those inequities, you know, and showcasing heritage and culture um, and oppression. Um, But there are some fascinating practices out there that are rooted in cooking where, you know, a mainstream conversation about that practice won't get to those issues. And we've, we hosted a conversation that's online now between Amethyst Ganaway and Reina Gascon Lopez, who talk about um, Gula Geechee culture and cooking in the South and making that practices more visible, but how, you know, a lot of these cooking practices are rooted in cooking out of oppression. And we'll be hosting a lot more of those kinds of conversations, whether yeah. online or in person. So from a curatorial perspective, I mean, it seems like most of your career has been leading up for you to create this company, Active Cultures. And from my understanding, you were on the curatorial staff at Mass Mocha, and you also were a curator at the Contemporary Art Museum of St. Louis. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah, that's right. What sort of things do you find to be the most interesting subjects in terms of you as a curator and things that you're just naturally drawn to? And how have those experiences throughout the years curating uh, shaped and informed your perspective as a person, but also your perspective on how you want to run a company such as like Active Cultures? I came from a traditional art history background. I have my master's in art history from Williams, and it's, it was there that I made my way to Mass Mocha, and it became quickly evident to me that what I was most interested in was working with artists, and working with artists in a way that 
we were producing projects together that somehow crept outside of the bounds of the white walled space. It took me about a decade to realize that looking back on the projects I developed with artists at different spaces in which I'd worked, but a number of touchstone exhibitions that I produced at St. Louis and at Masnoka too were ones that um, were collaborative, that brought in folks from other fields and that stepped outside of the exhibition space in one way or another. But it wasn't until the last few years before Glenn and I founded Active Cultures that I started to see retrospectively this perspective I'd had on exhibition making that was really rooted in hospitality. And being an institutional Hmm. curator, thinking about how the institution as a body is a space can be a space of hospitality and how it should be. What do you mean exactly by that? Well, you know, I think that institutions should be an open and welcoming space for all where we are curators and the institution Mm -hmm. are stewards of culture, stewards for artists, stewards for artwork, but also responsible for making their guests, making visitors feel not only welcome, but safe and comfortable having different kinds of experiences. Without providing answers, institutions should be hospitable spaces, hospitable bodies that compel convening and gathering and a space to engender meaning through connection. And I've always been interested in food and the practice of food in the work of chefs and cooks and other folks in that space. And I had brought, I mean, through, through, various ways, um, Mm -hmm. food practice or food as social practice into some of the projects I had produced with artists or I was inviting artists to work with because, Mm -hmm. you know, at that particular moment they were working in that way. It definitely was not a thread I would have seen clearly as it built. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't something I was looking out for. But I think these two impulses were started to come together more and more. And especially as I came to work with the Seattle Art Fair, where we had a huge audience, you know, something like 20,000 people coming through the doors, but it's an art fair, you know, there's not, there, it's, it's difficult to cultivate these really intimate moments of connection or gatherings among a group of folks that feels generative, you know, and special in a way, because, you know, at the end of the day, you can't get around the mechanics and the infrastructure of the fair and what its real purpose is. So, that's really what led me to um, jumping into the opportunity as Glenn and I started to flirt with this idea of building active cultures together. And I should say that Glenn was the partner. Well, I had been thinking, to be honest, of, of a kind of space to create in Los Angeles, a nonprofit. I didn't really know what it could look like or what it was until Glenn and I started talking. And Glenn was the partner I didn't know I needed also because yeah. Glenn has a Have history of space making. Time. Yeah. Glenn yeah. has a history of space making that goes back 20 years in Los Angeles. He founded one of the first artist run spaces called deep river, a space that gave Mark Bradford its first show. He was on the ground wow. floor as a founding board member of LAX art and the mistake room. And he's on the boards of the hammer and the music center. So he has as an artist, this, deep institutional memory, this muscle memory of founding institutions. He understands the value of space making in LA and creating new models. LAX art was when it was founded. Um, There was no space like it truly and, you know, anywhere. And the same can be said for the mistake room, one of the most diverse institutions in the country from nose to tail. So I feel really privileged to be able to Um, have Glenn as a co-founder and a board member and a partner in these projects. I mean, even as we build new models for sustaining the organization like Home Assembly, it's been critical for us Mm -hmm. to be able to have Glenn in the conversation as we grow. With all that being said, I mean, do you feel that sometimes the best ideas are just stumbled upon? I mean, given all of your experiences and, you know, different things that you go through in life and, you know, for instance, you were talking about your love for food and, you know, you having conversations with Glenn uh, and you both have worked within these various institutions related to the art world. 
and then you meet him and then have these conversations about things that are both of interest. But do you feel that great ideas are, are found naturally or what is your belief on that? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I think that <laughs> over the years, the projects that I value the most that have shaped the way I practice as a curator and think about art and meaning making are the ones I wouldn't have expected. The ones that might have been small side projects that turned out to be the catalyst for a whole new period in my life or way of working. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's, that's the way my life has been shaped, I'd say, always. Yeah. I mean, you know, from um, and where I found myself landing. I mean, I didn't expect to spend six years in Western Massachusetts or four in St. Louis. And that time has absolutely shaped the curator I am and the, the artists I seek out to work with and the values I try to bring forward in my practice. How do you feel about it? Have you found the same in your practice? I think so. I mean, you know, I'm very much a believer in stoicism, um, mm -hmm. you know, the, the works of Seneca and essentially relinquishing control of outside forces and only being in control of yourself. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, similar to the process of, I'll just, you know, use the podcast as an example, but, you know, it's like in the beginning, you are just trying to figure out how it's done. You know, yeah. how do you have a conversation with someone that's recorded <laughs> essentially? Right. And then, so I'm, you know, we can compare that probably to you as a curator and obviously, you know, you can tell me if I'm right or wrong, but, um, you as a curator in the beginning, you're probably just trying to figure out how to curate like your first show or something. Right. Mm -hmm. And then over time it, the more nuance and the more that you understand yourself and the more under, you understand uh, what you can do within that practice of curating, you find these things of interest and these points of interest. So given essentially, let's compare that also to painting, for instance, in the beginning, you're just trying to understand the technique of painting. You're trying to understand how paints mix and you know what that looks like when you put it on a canvas and, and you're building it up over time and what the intention is, right? So I think that essentially we're given all of these you know, assuming that we're curious people that, you know, want to grow and learn and, you know, to develop our craft further, we're given all these techniques. And then with those techniques, we try to figure out a voice through that, you know? Yeah. So I'm, I'm, that's why I was asking also about, you know, what, what are interesting points to you in terms of maybe your role as a curator and, and those sort of things. Yeah. Oh, sure. Um, well, that's lovely. I, I can say one of the perks of being a contemporary curator is that you occasionally get to become a, an amateur expert. It's, it's an oxymoron. Um, an amateur <laughs> expert yeah. in some arcane, bunch of arcane techniques or fashions of making something um, or you get to explore how other folks work in different fields. I mean, I when when I made an exhibition with Stephen Prina, an LA artist in St. Louis, he wanted to premiere a concerto that he composed. And so figuring out how to put on a concerto, a symphony, inside a concrete box of the Temporary Art Museum, <laughs> mm -hmm. when I have no depth of experience in music um, at all, was um, an education. And there we have it. And now I could do it again, probably. And when I produced this project with Spencer Finch, who is based in New York, Spencer is uh, an artist who's really invested in how to reproduce qualities of light and color that we perceive with the eye and also ways that are poetic and tied to history and literature. And there's a quite well-known project that he produced was an ice cream truck that creative time the public arts organization in New York brought to Central Park some years ago was originated by Spencer and me in St. Louis. And it was one in which Spencer created some a series of watercolors mm -hmm. from a, the sunset setting over the horizon from the rooftop of our museum. Those watercolors or the, the colors of those watercolors into um, 
a series of ice cream flavors, soft serve ice cream flavors. And we installed a soft serve ice cream machine in the front of the museum. It was powered by solar panels and had to figure out both the, you know, what happened with the, how to recreate the color. And Spencer was also interested in how we could recreate the kind of perception of the taste of the sun in the ice cream. Um, but putting all of those pieces together. What tastes like? Um, delicious <laughs> so ice cream. Hot. <laughs> it was hot and it burned your tongue. It yeah. burned your tongue off. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't freeze some, for yeah. some reason. Yeah. Um, you know, you figure out how how to rent solar panels, what the solar panel market looks like, how to install them on a temporary basis, how to power um, a soft serve ice cream machine safely, how to keep you know, soft yeah. serve ice cream temperatures to a quality that are you know okay to feed to the public. Um, mm -hmm. You know, all of these seemingly mundane details amount to a really beautiful and poetic project in the end. Yeah. And it's to be a producer alongside an artist in realizing their vision, something mm -hmm. that you never would have imagined before you started speaking with them before the invitation is made is extraordinary. And I think every part of the reason that I love working with artists. But I mean, speaking to what you just said about, you know, those uh, mundane experiences, being aware of those things, like, I mean, I don't know, I, I, I think maybe it's just, you know, the older that I'm getting personally, but I feel like being observant to those mundane experiences is actually kind of where the magic lies. Yeah. Right? You feel that way? Absolutely. Absolutely. And it connects you. It gives you the privilege of building your community too in ways that you never would have necessarily set out to do or imagined with the folks that you bring into the fold to collaborate in making an artist vision possible from fields that you, you know, never would have connected to professionally. Let's say, I mean, I'm thinking of Spencer's project, for example, or Stevens, and thinking about how you know you 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 start you can start to make connections to folks and you know to symphony players at the St. Louis Symphony or to mm. the <laughs> this small company of solar panel um, fabricators in St. Louis, or mm. you know yeah. the um, even thinking about how to steward a building and architecture when I was in St. Louis and getting to know the premier expert in concrete in the state mm. of Missouri, who was often on hand to preserve the pristine quality of the Tadao Ando concrete next door at the Pulitzer Foundation, I think is also where meaning making can happen. If you can, and if you can create ways to make that, those practices, those talents, that work visible when a project is manifest to a public that's really vital too, I think, you know, it is, and that's where I'm most interested in working with artists. I mean, and that's why, you know, Glenn again, mm -hmm. where it comes back to Glenn because his, his entire being as, a as an artist is about, I, I mean, I think in many ways about how he can make change in the world, not perform activism, but actually make change in the world uh, by, connecting folks and to produce art, yes, but also culture through various fields and industries that mm. can change people's lives. And that's really exciting to me. And that's where our purpose is in bringing fields together in active cultures too. Hmm. I know it sounds, it sounds hmm. utopian, but I think that, and it felt that way as we were building the mission. But I have to say with all earnestness that in this pandemic, those aspirations have felt more poignant than ever. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think, it, you know, at the end of the day, you kind of have to find the silver lining to things that you're not in control of, which, you know, goes back to some of those ideas of stoicism, yeah. being able to sift through the dirt and find the golden nugget, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if you will. But I, I guess my next question, you know, I just, I'm curious what you find to be the most rewarding out of those experiences of working with artists and coming up with these different projects. And, you know, what sort of things 
do you find to be the most rewarding? Do you think it's learning different processes or the collaborative experience or being able to produce these things and make them come to life when you had no idea how to essentially bring together a symphony orchestra, for instance, and, and those sort of things. Like what, what do you find to be the most interesting and um, poignant experiences, I guess? Yes. All of those things that you just said. And um, <laughs> I, you know, I think um, somewhat selfishly, but the hope is that, that others have the same experience as well. Um, that in that in holding space for an artist, then I'll use artist and you know with a capital A to to include, you know, folks in food and practitioners of, of different kinds. Sure, yeah. You can hold space for an artist to share her vision and her vision for the world, and in a way that compels us to see that world differently. And um, you know, it means I'm thinking about the world and my place in it in a new way each time we produce a project or a conversation. I think that that feeds me more than anything else. And, you know, if, and what our hope, my hope, but I think our hope as curators or cultural producers is, is that, you know, as, as much as, as we see the value in those experiences and that learning and in those platforms, we want to make, we want to share that with others. We want others to have that experience too. We want the public to have that experience. But I, I'd say that that is the most valuable if, is the opportunity to look deeper and in a sustained way at the proposal artists make for, for our place in the world and even how we can make it better. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think it's, you know, something that just comes to mind is that saying, um, you can lead the horse to water, but it has to take a drink. <laughs> Yeah. Right. So essentially with these art projects, it's you point towards a certain part of culture or a certain understanding for whatever it may be that you're curating essentially. But it's also, you know, the public's or whoever is viewing its perspective of themselves and how much they are self-actualized and how much they ask themselves certain tough questions. And, you know, I'm kind of speaking as an in general statement, but I think that's the thing with art is that it points to things psychologically that are embedded within us. If it's good art that yeah. is trying to get extruded from us. And I think that's how people actually connect with art is whether it's a film or whether it's a book, but it's something that is deeply profound to the human experience. And it takes a, a while. I mean, maybe for other people, it doesn't depending on how you grew up and your education and, and, and everything. But I think it takes a while for people to be, to realize certain parts of themselves and to be honest. Right. Yeah. So. Except I, I agree completely. And I think that for me, the works of art that have touched me most deeply are in my life. You know, I'm not speaking about necessarily projects that I've had a hand in producing or not, but um, are those in which there are more questions provoked than answers offered. Yeah. Mm. And I believe deeply that that, that kind of condition of being, you know, um, doesn't have to be mutually exclusive with accessibility. I think that the two can go hand in hand, which, you know, takes me back to what I, my belief in institutions needing to be hospitable and spaces for hospitality. You don't have to think about hospitality in the same word as, you know, the service industry, but, and in the commercial way, but really that you can, it, it's nuanced, but there are ways to make um, an experience of art accessible and mm. to try wherever possible to make folks feel comfortable in not knowing and even not yeah. understanding. Yeah, I think I think we've uncovered the golden nugget in the, <laughs> in the dirt that we were attempting to sift through. I think that's right. It's like the the questions, being able to have more questions and answers. And you know, unfortunately, I think we live in a society that tells you from a young age that you should have all these answers. Right. And people that are teachers are providing these answers and, you know, but I think that's the thing is 
the more that you just start learning more and more and more and have more questions, the more that you can actually attempt to understand the subtleties and nuance of a given situation and also to be able to learn and, and listen in each given situation, whatever that may be. Yeah. But yeah. anyways, <laughs> um, <laughs> so I have one more question for you and, and thank you so much for taking this time. Um, oh, it's my pleasure. What advice do you have for artists and creatives? Oh, brother. In what capacity? <laughs> or I, <laughs> I mean, in what context? I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> what kind of advice? <laughs> any advice, life advice, any sort of advice. I, I, I purposely make that question super general to see what someone will come up with. Man, I, you know, that is a tough question in this moment because, you know, they're in our now our third wave of the pandemic in Los Angeles. Yeah. We're talking about what it, you know, what it takes to make a living as an artist in LA in the future or, you know, or to survive as an institution in, in the US. Um, I think there's so, so much uncertainty abounds. I can say for myself, settling in and as a director of a nonprofit, settling into the uncertainty while saying yes to it, you know, a, a, hmm. as many opportunities around me as I can. I mean, with some judiciousness, you know, of course, mm -hmm. has made it a productive time. But I think that we don't know what this next year is going to look like. I mean, I know that no one knows what this next year is going to look like. Not I think I, you know, yeah. I can say with certainty, we don't know what this next year yeah. is going to look like. And for folks who are cultural producers you know, and trying to make meaning, not for ourselves, but for the world we live in and to make sense of it, the, mm -hmm. I see real possibility in rooting into your purpose as an artist, you know, um, and making space for that where you can, I mean, maintaining your practice if you can. And that may not be, I say that with appreciating that a lot of folks may not have space to get into the studio right now because yeah. it's a struggle to make ends meet. And, you know, I, what my hope is for all of us out there is that we um, we can give ourselves time and space, you know, for ourselves to to think about to consider time in a different way, you mm -hmm. know, to say yes to opportunities and experiment with them and be okay if they they aren't as generative for our own practices as we had hoped they'd be, you know, and then to be able to move on. But to be able to be gracious and kind of generous with yourself in how your practice evolves in, this, in these next couple of years, because everything has changed and will continue to change. I don't know. I'm so curious about what other people are saying to this question <laughs> for to you right now. <laughs> <laughs> Just get, yeah, um, all, all kinds of different answers. Yeah, it's, um, and it's also, yeah, depending on what sort of, industry they're in within yeah. the art because art is such a as a whole it could be you know anywhere from film to painting and 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 all all the above right so i mean i like your your answer you know about giving space for yourself to be honest with your practice yeah. and you know to be fortified and okay with the decisions that you make during this moment and and to also I mean, I, yeah, I think it's, for me, it's like a, always finding that silver lining, but I feel like I'm an eternal optimist too. So <laughs> there's kind yeah. of that. <laughs> I know. I, I feel the same way. And I, one thing that just occurs to me is that I think that something that artists are, and I'm, you know, I'm speaking from the outside because I'm not a practicing artist, but what I, in some conversations that I've had and from some things I've seen, it is really difficult right now to be an artist and to feel the pressure to make yourself visible to your community, to the art world, to a public, you know, to the gallery mechanism, to institutions. And I think that most of us could benefit from taking some of that pressure off of ourselves. And as you yeah. said, as you put it better than I did, being honest with your practice, because things will get better. We will gather again, institutions, museums will reopen, and there will be opportunities for us again, I hope very soon, 
to be with each other and to experience art again. And so, you know, changing the heart of the core of one's practice in order to be visible online or in some kind of capacity, let's say on social media, may not be worth it in the long term. So I would have the long game in view as much as possible. Definitely. Yeah. I think that's sound advice. I think it just sounded life advice too, is just always understanding why you're doing the thing that you're yeah. doing and to understand, is this because I need certain positive affirmations in my life in order for me to continue my practice? And maybe I'm draw. I mean, this, you know, you can, I mean, you can compare this to any aspect of life, uh, relationships, for instance, you know, like maybe a romantic relationship. It's like, am, do, am I comfortable within myself first mm -hmm. or am I seeking other people to make me feel comfortable because I'm not comfortable with myself, you know? And, and that could be, I think it's just a psychological thing that is embedded within us as humans. And that could be extrapolated upon with an art practice or with a career or, yeah. and, you know, and the good and bad challenges you to understand what you are as a person, but then also what matters really because also getting constant dopamine hits and positive affirmations isn't necessarily a good thing yeah. because, you know, I, I just think of like a child actor or something and how, you know, the, all those experiences and, you know, like sort of positive affirmations and things can develop like a, an interesting psychological effect, you know? And, mm -hmm. and so things aren't always as mutually exclusive, you know, as we were stating it earlier or like, they're not as simple as we might have thought in the beginning. If yeah. I'm making if I'm making sense on that. <laughs> I agree. I love yeah. it. Well, thank you so much for your time. I, I appreciate this and I appreciate you for um sending me that beautiful home assembly arrangement. And uh it was it was a great experience for me and my business partner to cook together in that way. It was a very bonding experience. So um, I appreciate you for giving that to us. I'm so glad. Thank you so much. I'm, you know, I would be remiss if I didn't encourage your listeners to experience the kit for themselves before um, the booking windows close in January. We just have a couple more weeks when you can pick up the kit and it supports, it's a great project. I mean, not only because we got to work with Nikki and Carol again, our founding collaborators whom we love so um, much, but also because it's a project that supports their restaurant and our nonprofit. So it's, it's a good opportunity to treat yourself or someone at the end of the year and support two entities that, you know, that need it at the end of the year. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Thank you so much. This has really been a pleasure. It's so nice to talk to you. Yeah. Nice to talk to you too. Thank you so much. Music for the podcast is by Rarebit, a.k.a. Justin Dosher Hopkins. Creative producer is Noah Wainwright. YouTube and creative support is by Tyler Scully. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time.